Okay, so here in chapter eight, we're going to be looking at how we account for our long-term assets. So here with my long-term assets, what we are concerned with primarily is how do we handle the initial purchase? How do I handle the actual sale of the asset at the end of its life? And what happens in the middle? So does this asset sit on my balance sheet at full cost for the entirety of its life? Maybe I bought a machine that's good for 15 years. Do I get to leave it valued at that initial cost all the way through that 15th year? Or should that valuation be coming down over time? And so we'll try to answer a lot of these types of questions here in chapter eight. So let's go ahead and get started. So here in chapter eight, we have to first understand what a plant asset is and how it differs maybe from just something like supplies. So the first physical requirement or the first actual requirement of a plant asset is that it is physical, that it is tangible in nature. So if you're not familiar with the phrase tangible or that meaning, that word, what we're saying here is I can reach out and put my hands on, or I can touch that actual asset. So the T in tangible, we want to line up with the word touch in our heads. So we remember this is something I can physically touch. If I can physically touch it, it is tangible in nature. So that is our first piece that we have to have for this to be a plant asset. Now, another area that we need to see here then is that this is actively used in our day-to-day -day operations, right? We're actually using this piece of equipment to help me run the company. The next area that we see is that this is expected to benefit future periods. So it's not just good for a week. It's not just good for a month. It maybe isn't even just good for one year, but this is something that we expect to be good for a while, right? More than one period. And finally, the last thing is that we will be referring to this as PP&E or property plan and equipment. I know right now when you hear PP&E, it's very tempting to think personal protective equipment. That is not what I need you to think in this class. In this class, what I need you to think when I say PP&E is property, plant, and equipment. That is what that abbreviation stands for in this class, and that is how we will be using that term. Now, over the life of an asset, there are essentially four distinct things that we need to consider. The first is we buy it at the beginning of time, right at the beginning of that asset's life for us at cost. But what is cost? Is it just the invoice price? Does it include things like shipping and training or testing? what's included in that cost and what isn't, All right? Are there some things that we might expect would be included but are actually excluded, All right? All of those types of questions we'll get to in just a little while. Now, the second thing that we have to consider is how do we allocate that cost over the life of the asset? And specifically, how many periods do I expect this to actually be useful for and to be providing benefit for? Next, what happens if we have additional expenditures occur over this asset's life. So how do we have, say we've got a car, we expect it to be good for five years, okay? What do we do with, say, an oil change? Does that get added to the basis of the car? Or what do we do if we change out the transmission, right? Are those treated the same way or are they treated differently? And finally, how do we handle the actual asset when we dispose of it, when I sell the car, when I get rid of the car in some fashion, and does it matter when that happens? Have I waited till the end of the assets life to do this? Or did I decide to sell my car after two years instead of five? What if it's not fully depreciated at that point in time? What if I sell it for more than I expected or less than I expected? All of these things get handled in a certain way. And that's what we're going to endeavor to figure out here in this chapter. There's a lot of these types of situations. How do we actually account for this? Now, the very first thing that we talked about then was this determination of cost. Well, of course, the determination of cost is the purchase price. That is, of course, the very first thing. But then there's this box up into the right a little bit that says all expenditures needed to prepare the asset for its intended use, as well as including all normal and reasonable expenditures necessary to get the asset in place and, of course, ready for its intended use. So you can see here, what we're talking about is not just the purchase price. This is anything to actually receive the assets. If I have to pay, say, shipping to actually get the asset sent, if I have to install some certain wattage item, if I have to install some certain type of wiring to be able to actually use this piece of equipment, whatever is needed for this asset to arrive 
and be hooked up and ready to go for my actual company to be able to use this is included in the cost of this asset. Now, one thing you'll notice and is very important is that it is not all expenditures. It is all normal and reasonable expenditures. So if you have something where employees keep breaking stuff, where employees keep messing up, where things keep getting slowed down, right, and it's not normal and reasonable, that is not included as part of the cost of the asset. But if it is a normal, reasonable item, that will be included. Now, for my next thing we want to look at, specifically, say, machinery and equipment, of course, the purchase price, any shipping charges associated with that. If I paid insurance on this while in transit, installing, assembling, testing, any taxes that were paid, all of this will be included in the cost of my machinery and equipment. Now, for buildings, we'll see things like, of course, the cost of purchase or construction. So if I'm actually building this, then, of course, the cost to build. If I'm buying a building that's already built, of course, that purchase price, any fees that I pay for brokerage, any attorneys that I had involved, any taxes that I'm having to pay or title fees, anything like this will be coming into the actual cost of that building. Now, land improvements are different, and so is land itself, because when we talk about land improvements, this is something that is sitting on the land. So this is things like parking lots and driveways, fences and shrubs and lighting systems, and all of this are improvements to land. They are not the land itself. And this is important because the land improvements actually do have a useful life. So that parking lot's gonna have to be repaved, say, every 10 years. The fence is gonna have to be rebuilt every 10 years. The lighting system we expect to be good for 15 years. Whatever that period of time that I expect this to actually be useful for is the period of time that I'll depreciate this over. But these are land improvements. Now, you'll notice that we have to account for the land separately from the improvements and separately from, say, the building that's on the land. Now, we recognize you can't have a building and not have land, right? You have to have somewhere to put the building. So that makes sense, but it's very important that we get the allocation between the building itself and the land correct because there is one key feature of land in accounting. Land is not, is not depreciable. Okay, so let me say that one more time. Land is not depreciable. But you'll notice the buildings and the land improvements that we just talked about are depreciable. That is why it's so important that we actually get this allocation between the land, which itself is not depreciable, and the items that are on top of the land, those improvements, as well as, say, the building, and get all of those things allocated properly. Now, when we're looking at land, we're looking at things like title insurance premiums, of course, the purchase price, any property taxes, surveying fees, real estate commissions, title search, and transfer fees. So there's all kinds of stuff here with land. Now, one thing that we want to look at next is with regard to land, these property taxes sometimes don't work the way that we would expect them to. So we'll pay a little bit closer attention to property taxes in just a little while. But for now, just make a note that property taxes may not always be included in the price of your land. So now my next area then is what we call a lump sum purchase. So when I deal with a lump sum purchase, what I am dealing with is the situation that I bought essentially a basket of goods, but I bought this for one price. So we're going to have to figure out how that actually works. So when we're dealing with a lump sum purchase, let's look at this example and see how this works. In this case, we are told the total cost of the combined purchase of land and buildings will be allocated notice based on their relative fair market values. And that's that blue text up top. So this is how we are going to determine the way that we're going to actually allocate this purchase price. So in this case, they tell me CarMax paid $90,000 in cash to acquire a group of items consisting of land, which was appraised at $40,000, and a building, which was appraised at $60,000. So do you see the problem here? We have to somehow square the fact that we essentially got $100,000 worth of assets, but we only paid $90,000. 
And you'll recall that we value our assets at cost. That's that historical cost principle, once again, going all the way back to chapter one, emphasizing once again why it is so vital that we have that strong understanding of chapter one as it continues to apply in each chapter thereafter. So in this case, I paid 90, but I got basically $100,000 worth of stuff. This is a good thing, but of course I can't record this valued at $100,000 on my financials if I only paid 90. Similar to what we saw a few chapters back when we were purchasing inventory, but taking that discount, we had to write down the inventory. The same type of thing is going to happen here. So in this case, the appraised value of my building was $60,000, while the appraised value of my land was $40,000, giving me a total appraised value of my assets in this lump sum purchase of $100,000. Now, I'll take my $60,000 for my building divided by my total valuation of $100,000, telling me that 60% of that purchase price should be allocated to the building account, while the remaining 40% should be allocated to land. At this point, all that is left to do is to multiply each one of those percentages by the actual amount paid, and that will be the amount that actually goes into the building account and the land account, respectively. So at this point, 60% of the $90,000 that was paid is $54,000, and that will be a debit to the building account, while $36,000, or that 40%, will be coming in through the land account, resulting in a credit to cash of $90,000. Now, for my next piece here, we're going to look at how we compute depreciation under a variety of methods. Now, up until this point in the semester, we've done this before, but we've only used straight line method. And so we'll start with straight line method, and then we'll move on to some of the others and see why we might want to use something else. But before we can do that, it's vital that we understand what depreciation is. So depreciation is defined as the systematic devaluation of an asset over the, over the time of its life or over its estimated life. So in this case, it is a systematic decline in value. It is not me making up numbers and reducing the value by some amount, right? I don't get to declare depreciation is $3,000 this year and 13,000 next year and 600 bucks the next and 400 the next because I just want that to be a, the, the depreciation amount. That's not the way this works. There is a reason, a method, that has to be employed. So we'll go through all of those methods here today, but the idea is when the asset is initially bought, the entire cost of that asset, and we talked earlier about exactly what's included in cost, but all of those things are included in cost and initially sit on the balance sheet in that asset account. But over the asset's life, that asset should decline in value because it will be less useful to me two years after it's bought than the day it was bought, and eight years after it was bought than the day it was bought. So as this asset gets older, it will decline in value, and that is what depreciation is there for. So as this asset declines, the amount on the balance sheet in that actual asset account will remain unchanged, but the actual book value of the asset will come down by making use of this contra asset account that we saw way back in chapter three first, which was accumulated depreciation. And so we'll see all of this working. And of course, as that accumulated depreciation balance is increasing, my book value is coming down and the amount of expense that is moving to the income statement over time is going to actually start flowing that direction. Now it could be the same amount in each year, it could increase, it could decrease, but we're going to see more and more of that, uh, that total cost for that asset actually moving through to my income statement through depreciation expense. Now, anytime I'm computing depreciation, there are essentially three pieces of information I need, at least for my straight line depreciation. So in this case, I need my cost, right? So how much I actually paid for this plus say shipping and installation and testing and all those things that we saw earlier. I need my cost. I then need my salvage value. Now my salvage value then is of course what I expect this asset to be worth at the end of its life. So if I think this asset will be worth $10,000 at the end of when I'm done using it, right? In say 10 years, I think it's gonna be worth $10,000. Then that is my salvage value. And unless my salvage value changes, 
I can never depreciate past salaries. So my book value at the end of my asset's life would never be able to be less than $10,000 because that is what I expect this to be worth at the end. So I would not be able to show this on my balance sheet at $3,000 if I actually thought I could eventually sell it for 10. This doesn't work. Now, if my salvage value ever changed, say eight years in, I look at this and I say, okay, the market has changed. I now think the salvage value for this is $3,000 then we would see that have to be dealt with at that point in time. And then at that point, my ending book value would be $3,000 at the end of year 10 instead of the $10,000. But we'll deal with that in just a little while. And finally, my last area here is my useful life. Of course, this is also an estimate. So the only thing that is actually anchored at any point in time here is my cost. I know for sure how much I paid for this asset. Everything else is a best guess. So because of that, we may actually run into some situations where over time, my estimates do change. And we'll see how that works in just a little bit. Now, in this case, we're going to be looking at three different methods of depreciation. The first being straight line, which we've seen before. The second being units of production, or what I call activity-based depreciation. So if you ever hear me talk about activity-based depreciation, it is this units of production method. So if I use more this year, then I should deduct more expense or I should have a larger amount of depreciation. But if I only produce three items instead of 300,000, well, doesn't it make sense that I would incur much lower depreciation? Of course it does. And so units of production does a little bit better job of matching up to the actual usage and does a little bit better job perhaps of following that matching principle. Now, my declining balance method, we come in and we see with declining balance that this is typically called double declining balance or DDB. <laughs> and when we see double declining balance, the idea here is that I'm actually going to be depreciating at two times the straight line rate, not two times the straight line amount, but two times the straight line rate. And we will see that in just a little bit. So. In my straight line method, we see that I have a cost of 10,000 and a salvage value of 1,000. This gives me what will be called a depreciable cost or a depreciable base of $9,000. So over the life of this asset, I should eventually record $9,000 in depreciation. Now we look and we see my useful life in this case is five years or 36,000 shoes. So in this case, I'm using the straight line method. I need that number of years on the bottom here. So I can see that I need to report $1,800 of depreciation each year. Now this entry, debit to depreciation expense, credit to accumulated depreciation, and then whatever the asset is, in this case, machinery, will be the same for every method that we see. So don't get too hung up on that, right? This is the same entry we saw way back in chapter three. What's going to change in this chapter is how we get that number. So pay more attention to the math. Now, in this case, you'll notice under the straight line method on the balance sheet and on my income statement, this is our presentation. So in this case, in these charts over here toward the top left, what we are seeing then is that in each case, in each year, you'll notice I am recording the same amount of depreciation expense. Now, this is assuming, of course, that I bought this asset on January the 1st in 2019. Had I bought this somewhere in the middle of the year, I would only be able to take, say, a partial year of depreciation in 2019. Then I would take full years in 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. And then I would have a partial year's depreciation left over. It would have to be taken in 2024. But this is what we're seeing. So this is under the assumption that we actually did buy this on January the 1st, 2019. Now, in my other case, we're looking on my balance sheet and you'll notice we are looking at what is called book value. So book value, if you remember, we talked about this formula way back in chapter three, I believe, and we said that this was cost minus accumulated depreciation. And that would give me what we called net book value or NBV. So that topic, that idea is still coming back around in this chapter. So you'll notice in each case, my cost it doesn't change. My cost, that is a historical number that we noticed earlier, was actually the same thing in each case. What does change, however, 
is my accumulated depreciation. Meaning that in the end, my actual net book value, which is what this chart is showing me, will end up declining. So the reason for this, of course, is that in year one or year 2018, right at the end of 2018, we had a balance of $10,000. Well, now one year later on 2019, what I am seeing then is this one year of depreciation, this $1,800 is coming out. So this is 10,000 minus the 1,800. But in year two, you'll notice my depreciation expense is still 1,800. But at that point, my accumulated depreciation is now the sum of these two items, which is 3,600. 10,000 minus 3,600 is now 6,400. In year three, well, now my depreciation in total or my accumulated depreciation is the sum of the first two years plus year three. So 1,800 times three is 5,400 and 10,000 minus 5,400 is $4,600. This is my ending book value or my net book value for year 2021. And we continue the process down the line. Now, what you'll notice is that in year 2023, my net book value is $1,000. That should be a familiar number to us because this right here, we labeled earlier as my salvage value. So if that is my salvage value, then it would make sense to me that that would be my net book value after I have fully depreciated this item. Now, if I was to actually look at year 2024, what I would actually see then is that barring a change in one of my estimates, my actual net book value in year 2024 would still be the $1,000 because it can't be anything else. If 1,000 is my salvage value, at no point can I depreciate past salvage. So that asset would have to remain on the books at $1,000. And what that would also tell me is that in year 2024, if I looked at my income statement, my depreciation expense would be zero because I wouldn't be able to continue depreciating. I had already depreciated that full $9,000 over the five years. So any year I continue using this asset after that point results in zero depreciation expense. So very good. And that's what they're showing me here. Now, in this case, they're showing us the actual machinery at cost, which is what we said we should see because the machinery should be valued at all times at cost. But we then have to consider the actual effects of depreciation. And on the balance sheet, the account that does that is accumulated depreciation. Once again, a contra asset, meaning that account increases with a credit. And so we are seeing this effect of the actual cost of 10,000 minus my 3,600. And that will give me my net book value here of 6,400. And of course, this is showing me the math for the year 2020. Okay. So if you have any questions on this, please let me know. Otherwise, we will go ahead and move into our next area. So if you have a question you know, on any of this, come to class with it. Be ready to talk about it and ask me. I'm always happy to go over it with you. Um, I know there's a lot of moving pieces here in Chapter 8, but I really like Chapter 8 because it does a really good job helping us see what is going on in the background and why companies might make decisions the way that they do in certain cases. So in this case, we have our depreciation schedule. And we can see that in 2018, there was no depreciation incurred. So what that tells me then is actually, we didn't buy this on January 1st. And truthfully, we saw this here too, because we saw that we actually had the asset at the end of 2018, because this was my year end book value telling me that we actually bought this on December 31st. And that is why in 2019, we had a full year's depreciation because we bought it on 1231. So no depreciation was incurred. And then we had it from January 1 through the end of 2019. So on this next slide, then what we're actually coming in and seeing is how this depreciation schedule would look. So for the first year, all we had was a book value. Now for the next year, my depreciable cost you'll notice was still $9,000. My depreciation rate was 20% because this is a five-year asset. And under straight line, we take the same amount every year unless we buy this in the middle of the year. Then the first and the last year will have to deal with a partial. But everything else in the middle would be the same. So in this case, 9,000 times 20% is $1,800. 
That will be the amount of depreciation expense taken in each period. Now, in year one, what we will see then is, or I'm sorry, in year 2019, my accumulated depreciation is actually equal to my depreciation expense. And that's because I've only reported one year's worth of depreciation. But in year two, in year 2020, my depreciation expense, you'll notice, stayed constant at 1800, while my accumulated depreciation has now doubled to 3600, which is the sum of both years' depreciation expense. Now in 2021, we've increased again to 5,400, but my depreciation expense is staying, staying consistent at 1,800. Now you'll notice at the same time that all of this is happening, my book value is continuing to decline because my book value is equal to cost minus accumulated depreciation. And of course, my overall cost was the $10,000. So 10,000 minus 18 is 82, 10,000 minus 36 is 64, et cetera, et cetera. So very good. Now, for my next slide, we're going to actually look at what I call activity-based depreciation or units of production depreciation. So you'll see both of those terms depending on which book you're looking at and which sources you pull up online. So I wanna make you familiar that they are actually the same thing. Now, in this case, the first thing I have to do is figure out a depreciation amount, the depreciation amount, I'm sorry, on a per unit basis. The way I'm going to do this is take my cost minus my salvage value, and then I'm going to divide by the total units of production that I expect over this asset's entire life. All right, so if I think this machine will produce 1 million units for me over its life, then my total units of production is 1 million. Now, if I only produce 10,000 units in the first year, then I'll have to multiply that rate by the 10,000 units. But if I only produce, or if I say produce 150,000 units, then I'll multiply that rate by 150,000. And so we don't need a time period adjustment for units of production or activity base because the assumption is if you had the asset longer, you would have produced more. So we've already essentially dealt with the partial year item because it's essentially reflected in the amount of production that was actually done. So in this case, I will take my depreciation per unit times my number of units produced that period. So in this case, we're using the same information and we're told we expect this asset to be able to produce 36,000 units over its entire life. Well, if we produce 7,000 units in the first year, how much depreciation do I need to record? So in this case, I'll start by taking my cost of 10 minus my salvage of one, giving me $9,000, which is of course that depreciable base. We will then divide that by the number of units that we expect to be able to use this for in total, which in this case is 36,000 pairs of shoes. Or I'm sorry, 36,000 shoes. So for each shoe that is inspected, we should be recording 25 cents of depreciation. Well, then, then they tell me in my first year, we actually inspected 7,000 shoes or 7,000 units. So the amount of depreciation in this case then is 25 cents times the 7,000 shoes that were inspected, giving me a total of 1750. Now you'll notice very similarly, what we will see then is that we end up with a table quite similar in initial format to what we saw before, but there are some key distinctions. Here, we are looking at my number of units. And you have to be very careful. If I ever give you a table like this, the first thing I would do is add straight down this column and make sure that what I gave you in this case equals 36,000 units. Because if I had given you, say, something that totaled out to 40,000 units, then the last 4,000 would not be getting depreciated and you'd have to be able to catch that. So in this case, this does actually come out to a nice even 36, so there's no real issue, but certainly something you want to think about. Now, on a per unit basis, then we see that my cost here is 25 cents, and that's what we got just a second ago for my depreciation expense. So in each case, I'll take my number of units times my depreciation per unit to get my depreciation expense for that year. Of course, in the first year, my depreciation expense is the same as accumulated depreciation and book value now will be equal to my book value of before, in this case, the $10,000. So we'll come in, we'll take the, let's see here, we'll get a different color. We'll say we'll take my $10,000 minus my accumulated depreciation of $17,50, which gives me $82,50.
Now at this point, you can continue down by taking my book value here of 8250 minus my next year's depreciation expense of 2000, which will give me 6250. Continuing this pattern down, eventually you will come to a point where your book value ends up being $1,000. This will be the end of my depreciation unless my salvage value changes. Now, if you wanted to actually use the real formula, you certainly could. And the real formula in this case would be to always anchor back to the fact that cost was $10,000. And if cost is $10,000, then in year one, my accumulated depreciation, we saw that was $1,750, resulting in book value, oops, resulting in my book value here being equal to $8,250. Now for the next year, I can always go back, take my cost of $10,000, take out my next year's accumulated depreciation, which in this case was $3,750. And that will give me a book value for that year of $6,250, which is exactly what we see. And then continue this process all the way down the page. So whichever method you feel more comfortable with is fine. It will give you the same result. Now, leaving this question then, we'll go ahead and clear out all of our drawings and we'll go ahead and move on to our next slide. So my next method that we are concerned about here is what is called the declining balance method of depreciation. Now, the most common decline here is what we call double declining. So that is the one I will focus on. But of course, you could do this with any percentage, right? You could do 150%, you could do 300% or 800%, whatever it is, right? But you have to be consistent. So in this case, the most common by far is the double declining balance method. So the reason that we think this might do a better job than straight lines actually identifying and following that matching principle is that early on in an asset's life, it is far more productive than it is in the later years. By doing this double declining balance method, we are identifying the fact that because this asset is more productive early on, it should be generating more revenue than it will later. And because of that, more of the cost should be associated with these earlier periods of time. And that is what we see with the double declining balance method. Now, earlier, when I first mentioned this method, I said something very important. I said that with the double declining balance method, we take two times the straight line rate but not, please hear me carefully, not two times the straight line amount. And that is because of the difference in how these formulas work. Under double declining balance, I will take two times my straight line rate times my beginning of period book value. <coughs> so in this case, in 2019, we noticed that my beginning method or my first method that we looked at was straight line depreciation and under that method my depreciation rate each year was 20 percent well under double declining my depreciation rate will be 40 percent but you'll notice something very important i'm simply taking my 40 percent times that ten thousand dollars times that beginning of year book value but you will notice that i have not done anything at this point with my salvage value. I simply took my 40% times my $10,000. That gave me $4,000 for depreciation expense, which of course gives me 4,000 for accumulated depreciation, bringing me down to $6,000 in book value. Now for my next period, I simply continue the table. I start with my 6,000 book value times my 40%. That gives me 2,400. 2,400 plus 4,000 is 6,400, and 10,000 minus 6,400 is 3,600. Now, if you follow this all the way down the table, what you will notice is something quite peculiar. If I take 1,296 times 40%, I don't come out to 296. That's true. But this is the problem with double declining, is you have to be very careful. Remember that rule about salvage value, how I can never depreciate past salvage. Well, what that tells me then is in this case, I am not going to be able to actually take the full 40% in year 2023. I can only take what is left. Well, in this case, my depreciable base was 9,000, which meant my ending book value had to be 1,000. 
So for this last year, what I would do is start with my 1296 and immediately I would just plug in this 1000. I know that's where I'm having to end. All right, and the reason I would do this is the, truly, I guess the first thing to do is to take your 1296 times 40%. When you do that, that will be more than the 296, pulling your book value to less than $1,000. As soon as you identify the point at which that happens, erase that work, drop in your actual salvage value as your ending book value. Now you work this backwards. Well, for this to be 1,000, my accumulated depreciation then must be nine. And for this to be nine, when it was just 8704, means this must now be 296. And so this is the way that we handle double declining. So it's a little bit tricky because we have to manually stop depreciation from going past salvage. The other two methods that build that in at the beginning, double declining does not. And it is in an effort to recover as much cost as quickly as possible. Now you'll notice under the methods over time, the actual totals for depreciation are the same. It's simply when that occurs. And you'll notice that companies typically like the straight line method. Okay, certainly these other methods do get used but companies generally prefer the straight line method because it is so easy to use. So while the other methods may be slightly more accurate, the most popular by far is straight line, at least for book reporting. Now, when we're talking about tax reporting, it's a little bit different. Most corporations don't want to use this for tax reporting. Instead, they want to use what is called maker's depreciation, MACRS, which is Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery. Now, this provides for a rapid write-off of an asset's cost, which means that I am reducing my taxable income very quickly. This encourages the companies to actually reinvest because they're able to eliminate the total cost of that asset in very few years. What this means is once that asset is completely written off for tax purposes, I'm no longer receiving a tax deduction for it. So if I'm not receiving that tax deduction anymore, it might encourage me to go buy a new asset that I can now start depreciating again and start getting that tax write off again. So it's very important for companies typically to use these cost recovery systems that are accelerated because they actually help to stimulate new investment and keep the economy thriving. Now, what happens if I buy an asset in the middle of the year? So in this case, we see when an asset is purchased or sold during the year, depreciation should be calculated only for the fraction of the year the asset is owned. So assume we purchased our machinery on October the 1st. If we have to calculate depreciation at the end of the year, much like we saw in Chapter 7 calculating interest, I will always recommend that you keep any time calculations in a fraction over 12. So in this case, we bought this in October. That is three months that have passed, October, November, December. So all three full months have expired, meaning I owned the asset for three months. I get to depreciate the asset for three months. So I'll take my 9,000 over five, which is $1,800 per year. But because I only own this for one quarter, then I get to multiply this by three over 12, showing me that I need only $450 of depreciation expense. Now, as we said earlier, the only piece of this depreciation situation that we actually know for sure is right is the cost, which means everything else can change and it often does. So now we're going to have to look at how we handle a change in estimate. So in this case, we see that we had machinery from our previous example. Assuming that the beginning of, at the beginning of the asset's third year, the book value is $6,400. So this is under straight line depreciation. We saw that we needed $1,800 in depreciation each year. At the beginning of year three, we dealt with two full years. So that is two times 1,800, which is the 3,600. And we'll take the $10,000 cost minus the 36, giving me that $6,400 book value. So that is where we're picking up. At that point in time, we determine that the machinery will actually have a remaining useful life of four years, All right? So before we thought the asset was good for a total of five years, and now we believe a remaining life of four, meaning we actually are saying this asset has a life of six years. We've already dealt with two, we are now expecting four more. So now instead of five years, we're expecting six years of depreciation. 
And at the same time, because we expect this to last longer, we do not expect to receive as much cash for it at the end. So my salvage value is actually decreasing from $1,000 to 400. At this point, I'll need my beginning of period book value, 6,400 minus the $400 in the salvage value that I now expect to collect at the end of the next four years. And we'll divide this by the remaining life of four years, which is $1,500 per year. Now, the good news is this is what is called a prospective change. A prospective change in accounting means that from the point of the change forward, we actually make the adjustment. A retrospective adjustment would mean that we'd have to go back and restate depreciation in the previous years, starting with year one to reflect this new situation. That is not how we handle changes in depreciation estimates. So in this case, this is what is called a prospective change looking forward will make the adjustment. But we don't need to restate anything because everyone on board recognized that all those depreciation estimates were estimates. So we can't hold you too tightly to that. All we're asking you to do is the absolute best that you can do. Give me the best information available at that point in time, and we'll move forward from there. Now, what is asset impairment? So with asset impairment under US GAAP, this is when we have a permanent decline in what is called the fair value of an asset, meaning that we now have to write the asset down to that new fair value. The way that we do this is by debiting an account called impairment loss, and we'll actually credit accumulated depreciation on that equipment. So this is how we're going to handle impairment. So it's very similar to my journal entry for depreciation, but it is not depreciation, it is actually called impairment. Now, how do we identify when something's been impaired? How do we handle that? What is the actual testing procedure? All of that is a topic for intermediate accounting. So I will leave it until there. In this class, I simply need you to know if I tell you an asset is impaired, what that journal entry looks like. And in this case, it is a debit to impairment loss and a credit to accumulated depreciation on equipment. Now, the next topic that we have deals with something that we mentioned early on in this lecture, which was something like, if I have a car, how do I handle an oil change versus rebuilding the entire engine or replacing the transmission? Well, one of those is what is called a revenue expenditure. I'll give you a hint. The way that you want to remember revenue expenditures is essentially like any revenue. This is something that only deals with that period, right? So similar to an expense. This is something that deals with right now, a small amount, a routine procedure. So an oil change, while it does materially increase the life of the car, because if I don't ever change my oil, my car will not drive for very long, right? We recognize that. But because it is such a small amount, I'll simply record the oil change expense or that expense related to that as an income statement expense that will be dealt with in the current period. That is a revenue expenditure. Is anything very small, routine maintenance. I'm greasing the gears, I'm doing whatever, right? Anything like that is what is referred to as a revenue expenditure. A capital expenditure, on the other hand, provides benefits for more than one period and typically will be recorded as an addition to the asset account and will then be reported on the balance sheet. So in the case where I rebuild the engine for my car, that is a significant improvement, certainly a material improvement to the car, which will dramatically improve the life of that car. And as such, this is a capital expenditure going onto the balance sheet. Now, what this means is that my ordinary repairs maintain normal operating condition but they don't increase productivity by themselves. And essentially that was built into the original estimate, right? When I originally estimated the life of my car, I did it assuming that, yeah, I'm gonna change the oil when I need to. If I hadn't assumed that from the beginning, I would say, okay, well, my car's probably got a useful life of a few months because it's not gonna last for very long if I'm not changing the oil. But because I'm estimating this, assuming all ordinary normal repairs are being done, then I can actually estimate out a much longer life for my car. So that's anything ordinary. But a betterment or an extraordinary repair is something that actually is a major overhaul, a rebuilding of something, a new design process, something major has changed. And this typically does extend our life beyond that original estimate. <coughs> so how do I actually deal with the journal entries here? 
Well, if it's an ordinary expense, it simply goes in through repairs expense with a credit to cash, assuming we paid in cash, right? But you'll notice here that amount, that repairs expense, is actually now coming through and going to reduce income in the current period. But with the betterment, I'm sending this through to machinery at first with a credit to cash. What this is doing then is increasing my machinery account, which will of course then have to be depreciated over time as the machinery gets used. So it is a deferral of that expense until a later period. Now, the next topic we need to look at is what happens when I get rid of an asset? <clears throat> so if I actually am disposing of the asset, if I receive cash, of course, I'll debit cash. If I paid cash, of course, I'll need to credit cash. And I will need to remove the asset. So to remove the asset, I will credit the asset. I will then need to remove the accumulated depreciation with a debit. And then I will plug the difference with a gain or loss. So here's our rule. If cash received is greater than book value, you have a gain. If cash received is less than book value, you have a loss. And if cash equals book value, there is no gain or loss. So in this case, let's see how this works. If we have a machine costing $9,000 with accumulated depreciation of $9,000 on December 31st, we see that this asset was discarded on June the 5th of the current year. The company was depreciating with straight line over eight years with no salvage. And what we'll see is we didn't receive any cash here. I didn't pay any cash. I just got rid of the asset. By getting rid of the asset, I'm crediting machinery, debiting accumulated depreciation for that machinery, and completely eliminating that asset off my balance sheet. If I no longer have the asset, it should not be reported on my balance sheet at all. Now, if I have an asset that is not fully depreciated, but I'm still disposing of it, the first thing I have to do is actually update my depreciation. So in this case, we're told we have equipment costing 8,000 with accumulated depreciation of six as of 1231 of the previous year. But we sold this on July 1st, meaning six months have expired in the new year. This means that the company is using straight line, or I'm sorry, in this case, we assume the company is using straight line over eight years with no salvage. So the first thing I have to do is actually figure out what my depreciation expense was per year. So you will remember my formula for straight line is cost, in this case, 8,000 minus salvage, which is zero, divided by life of eight years. So that is $1,000 per year. But I sold this in the middle of the year. So I should record depreciation expense for the period of this year that I actually had the asset. I do that by taking $1,000 times a half or times six over 12, giving me depreciation expense of $500, and accumulated depreciation on equipment of $500, bringing that depreciation up to current date. Now we actually discard the asset. So I need to remove the full amount of accumulated depreciation for 6,500. The way we do that is with a debit. I need to remove the entire balance of that equipment account, which of course is an asset. So to get rid of it is a credit. And now I look, I have 6,500 in debits, 8,000 in credits. I need a debit. And the debit I need here is a loss on disposal of the equipment for $1,500. Now, in this case, if I sell an asset at book value, how do we handle that? So we see on March 31st, we sell equipment that originally cost us 16 and has accumulated depreciation of 12 at the end of the prior year. BTO uses straight line depreciation of $4,000 per year, and the equipment is sold for $3,000 in cash. So the very first thing I have to do then is update my depreciation. I sold this at the end of the third month, so I had this for three months out of 12. So I'll take 4,000 times three over 12, which is 1,000. That will be my adjustment now that I need to make for depreciation. So debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation on equipment for the 1,000, bringing that accumulated balance up to 13. Well, in this case, I received cash for 3,000, which of course is a debit. I need to remove the balance of my equipment, which of course is the original cost of 16 with a credit. And of course, in this case, my accumulated depreciation at the date of the sale was 13,000. So that will be a debit as well, resulting in me actually showing no gain or loss because I sold at book value. Now, if I sell above book value, we're looking at the same situation here, but now I'm selling at a price of $12,000. I'm sorry, I'm selling at a price of $7,000. 
So in this case, my update for depreciation is the same, but now my journal entry, I come down, I debit cash for seven. I'll still credit the equipment for 16 and debit my accumulated depreciation for 13. At that point, I now have 20 in debits and 16 in credits, leading me to see that I need an additional credit, which is a gain on disposal of equipment for $4,000. Now, if I sell below book value, what we'll see then, if we can get it to load real quick. Very good. My initial update is the same as we've seen in the last two because we are still selling at 331, but now we're selling this for $2,500. So in this case, I'll debit cash for 2,500, credit my equipment for 16 and debit accumulated depreciation for 13. At that point, I have 15,500 in debits and 16,000 in credits, showing me that I need a debit to loss on disposal of equipment for the $500 difference. Now, the last area of this chapter deals with natural resources, or one of the last areas of this chapter deals with natural resources. So natural resources are different than physical assets that we keep on top of the ground because of the nature of the asset. So here we need to look at the fact that we will not be seeing depreciation expense and depreciation when we deal with natural resources, we will actually be seeing what is called depletion. So this will be depletion expense. So in this case, we will see that the depletion will be charged, of course, over the period of time benefited. And this is extracted from the natural environment. Of course, reported at cost less what we call accumulated depletion. And this can be anything like oil, coal, diamonds, gold, anything that comes out of the ground typically are our natural resources. In this case, we'll see a mineral deposit with an estimated 250,000 tons of available ores purchased for 500,000. We expect zero salvage value. So in this case, what we'll have to do is the most common way to do depletion is with activity-based depletion, or what we saw earlier as units of production. So we'll first come in. We'll need to get a rate. So I'll take my cost minus salvage. In this case, 500 minus zero is, of course, still $500,000, divided by my estimated tons of 250,000, giving me a rate here of $2 per ton. In this case, it looks like we extracted and sold 85,000 units. So two times 85 is 170. So in this case, my depletion expense in the first year is $170,000 with a debit to depletion expense and a credit to accumulated depletion, of course, noting the mineral deposit. Now odds are if I've got this big mineral deposit, I've probably got more than one. So I would probably want to know which mineral deposit this was in practice. And I would likely have a mineral deposit ID number on this as well, mineral deposit 187B, right? Or mineral deposit 2694A, whatever it is, but I would need some way to identify exactly which mineral deposit this is. But in here, just using mineral deposit is fine. Now, my balance sheet presentation in this case will look something like this. I'll see my mineral deposit, less that accumulated depletion, showing me the balance of $330,000. Now, my depletion expense when some ore remains unsold at the end of the year is as follows. In this case, my depletion expense will be dealing with the portion that was actually sold. In this case, we extracted 85,000 tons. We sold 70. The 70 that were sold will be running out through depletion expense on that mineral deposit with the credit to accumulated depreci depletion, of course, being the 170. Now, the ore inventory of 30 will, of course, be sitting here as the difference. Now, when I have plant assets that are used for extracting, we will see that specialized plant assets may be required to actually extract this, and these are typically recorded in a separate account and depreciated. Now, the last topic is a different type of asset, which is what is called an intangible asset. So intangible assets are different than property, plant, and equipment because if you remember the very first item that we talked about for something to be PP&E, was that it is tangible. Well, intangible assets certainly are not. So these are non-current assets that lack physical substance, but often provide exclusive rights or privileges. So these are useful for a certain period of time, but sometimes that's difficult to determine. And typically these will be acquired for use in operations. Now, when we talk about these, these are things like what we see as patents and copyrights. Um, franchises, trademarks, right of use, research and development, other items, leasehold improvements and goodwill, 
all sorts of things. But a couple of things I really want to talk about in depth. The first here is patents. When do I need a patent? I need a patent anytime I develop something that is typically an, an actual item, right? So if I design a new type of computer, I would need to get a patent on that computer to make sure no one else designs the same type of computer. If I have a new musical type of item though, I don't need to go get a patent, right? If I write a new song, I'm not going to the patent office. I'm going to the copyright office. I'm filing for a copyright on works of art. So this can be songs, music, film, anything like that, we are getting a copyright. Franchises are a little bit different because with a franchise, this is when, say for example, I want to start a restaurant. I think I'll go into the fast food industry and I say, man, McDonald's seems to do well anywhere you put a McDonald's, I'm gonna build a McDonald's. I can't just go out and buy me a plot of land and start constructing a McDonald's because McDonald's is a franchise, which means I have to actually buy the right to open up a McDonald's by buying into the franchise. Then I will be considered a franchisee and the franchise will do all of the promotion and marketing and training and all of that for me. All I'll be responsible for is my actual building that I'm owning and my actual operations in that location. This is why sometimes if you go to one McDonald's or one franchise location for anything that is franchised, you'll have a really great experience. It'll be really fantastic. And the food is excellent, the service is wonderful, everything is neat and clean. And then you go down the road 10 miles, you stop again, and it's a complete train wreck. There's no good training for the employees, the food is terrible, the restrooms are dirty, the floor is filthy, right? everything is terrible. And it's because when you're dealing with a franchise, it's not the same everywhere in the sense that the same person owns it. The franchisee owns each franchise. So that if I own one building and you own the next, you may get totally different service in the different locations, even though it is the same company. So you have to be kind of careful when you're dealing with franchises, but this is the idea. Now, trademarks are another really important one here. And with trademarks, I used to tutor when I was actually a student at the university. And I tutored a lot of different accounting, economics, finance, and statistics courses. And so I always joked whenever I got to this point in tutoring, where we were talking about trademarks that I was considering designing a business card because my name is Mark, called Mark's Tutoring. And for my symbol, for my logo, I was gonna do this nice big loopy yellow M, right? And I would always ask, well, am I allowed to do that? So if we think back to McDonald's, right? That big loopy yellow M is actually trademarked by McDonald's. So if they wanted to, and I started advertising my tutoring services using that, they could actually file against me for violating their trademark. Now, odds are, as small as I would be, <clears throat> it probably wouldn't be worth their time, but it certainly is something they could pursue if they found out about it and they were angry enough about it to actually deal with it. So a trademark gives you the exclusive right to this symbol. For McDonald's, it's the big loopy M. For Nike, it's the swoosh. But we see these all the time and they are actually legally protected. Now, the next one is Goodwill. Goodwill is really interesting because when you hear Goodwill, you might think of the store, right? The store is fine, it's a great company, that's all well and good. When I talk about Goodwill in here, I am absolutely not talking about the store. What I am talking about is when you purchase a company and you pay more than the actual net assets of the company. So I'm buying your business and your business is actually valued at $800,000, but I pay you $1 million for it. At that point in time, I will have goodwill for the difference of $200,000. Now what that means and why I might do this, you say, well, why on earth would you pay more than a business is worth? And this might be because of things that are just inherently difficult to value. So for example, you've got your restaurant. So you are operating on this really busy corner of town. You've got a prime location, all this stuff. People are constantly cycling in and out of your business. And people know for the last 20 years, if you want a good dinner, you go to your restaurant. But now you're selling. Well, people don't know right away that you sold. So they're going to continue coming because of the reputation that you have established. Now, if I wanted to open my own restaurant, I certainly could but I wouldn't have this loyal customer base right off the bat. 
I wouldn't have this customer list right away. I wouldn't have this perceived level of quality that's been built up for the last 20 years. So this type of stuff leads to me actually paying more than what I can physically value sometimes. And this is where we see goodwill coming in. Now, the truth is, at some point, people will notice that the business has been sold. I will either continue to run the business well, and customers will be happy with the service and the quality, or I will start to run the business into the ground, and people will figure out pretty quickly the food's never right, the service is terrible, the lines are slow, whatever it is, but they'll notice the change. So with goodwill, it's not something that sticks around permanently, but how we actually deal with goodwill over time is a topic for intermediate accounting. Right. It seems like this is a hot topic of debate frequently in the United States and the proper accounting for goodwill gets changed pretty frequently. So we'll have to deal with that in intermediate. But for now, in an intro class, I just need you to know what it is and that it has to be bought. Right. We buy goodwill by paying too much for, an, for a company or for this operation when I actually purchase the business. Now, the rest of these certainly are important, but they're not nearly as common in this course. So I'm going to go ahead and skip over those. Now, the very last thing in here is another ratio, which is total asset turnover. And in this case, this is net sales divided by average total assets. So here we're just seeing how efficient am I at using my assets? So in this case, you can see between Starbucks and Jack in the Box, it does appear that typically Starbucks is quite a bit more efficient in using their assets than Jack in the Box. And this is a good thing. Now, one thing this is going to help me see is, am I having just way too many non-productive assets? So maybe I've got way too much just sitting in cash and cash isn't actually helping me to be productive. So maybe I could invest that cash in equipment that would boost efficiency. And I would still have the same amount of assets perhaps because I'd just be investing in something else, but it might be generating more sales resulting in a higher total asset turnover helping me see when I'm not being as efficient as I could be. Now, after this, the rest of this is dealing with the appendix. I'm not going to get into the appendix in this course. If you want to look it over, certainly feel free, but there's nothing in there that I need you to understand for this class. So if you have any questions, once again, please, please, please never hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to meet with you and try to help you get caught up, but please let me know if you are struggling. I'd be happy to try to help you with that. Otherwise, we'll see you in class. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next time.